colleague and friend, Kavita Shah Aurora, who we invited here today. Kavita is currently an associate professor of reproductive biology and bioethics at, as well as the Dirker Biscotti Endowed Professor of Women's Health and Wellness at Case Western Reserve University. She is a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and she's also the department's uh, director of quality. She went to Penn State for um, undergrad and then for medical school went to Jefferson and also got her MBE from the University of Pennsylvania for going back to Big Ten schools for Northwestern for a residency. And she has now done another master's in science and clinical research. I got to know Kavita and her husband, as well as now her two kids, really well through her work with the American Medical Association, where she is on the governing council of the Young Physicians section, and I believe a former CJO member. So that's a big deal, obviously, in the ethics of the AMA work. Um, she has multiple research interests, including reproductive ethics, disparities surrounding postpartum contraception and sterilization, patient-centered quality of care, uterus transplant, and ethics education. However, in my opinion, her claim to fame is writing, co-writing with me, a very brief stat news piece that has now had more eyeballs on it than any other piece I've ever written on the ethics of reading an ultrasound on the fixer upper star where someone commented on the ultrasound. So you never know what you're going to write that people look at, but my, as an orthopedic surgeon, it's very exciting to have a colleague in obstetrics who will work right with you. So without further ado, be to Shah Aurora. that young men um, seem to influence a lot of physicians and their decisions about 
offering uh, sterilization. But you didn't exactly explain how the MI was yeah. influencing that, so I, I'd love to hear that as well as perhaps your thoughts on how weight stigmatization could be playing a role in who uh, doctors think should be a parent or not. Yeah. So thanks for the question. I, I immediately looked at Dr. Hubbard when I made the BMI comment, right, because I wrote a body of work on that issue. Um, so we did drill into that issue on a, it's a survey, um, so we weren't able to. Uh, but in some of the interviews it popped up, and just from clinical practice, what I can tell you is that people don't want to struggle, especially for something that they don't value as a priority. Right? So if you go in a priori with the concept that sterilization isn't that important, it's not urgent, why doesn't she just get an IUD? Then in the middle of the night, when the C-sections have finally died down and you have some OR time, you're probably less willing to stay up in order to do a elective surgery on somebody with a higher BMI than an easier surgery on somebody with a lower BMI. Uh, there is an incision that you need to make after delivery that we make around the umbilicus. And what I often tell my colleagues is that incision will just have to be bigger if somebody has a higher BMI. But that's not my yes-no decision making, that's the patient's yes-no decision making. If she accepts the risk that her incision is just going to have to be a little bit bigger, this is important enough for her, then who am I to tell her that risk is too much? Um, and the alternative of a interval, which is a laparoscopic surgery, um, does have smaller incisions, right? Um, but again, we know there's barriers to people coming back for that surgery, and it's not like general anesthesia is without risk there um, versus a spinal right after delivery. And so really that trade-off should be at the patient level and with shared decision-making rather than this arbitrary cutoff of BMIs, which are often in a lot of hospital policies that they just won't do it above a certain BMI. I think, um, not to complicate this, even more, um, but Esher was taken off the market a few years ago. Does anybody know about Esher? Yeah, so it's a hysteroscopic sterilization. So we never had a incisionless way to sterilize before, right? You always had to do some sort of surgery, whether it's during the C-section, um, after delivery, like I said, with a special, like a separate incision around the umbilicus or this laparoscopic afterwards. So Esher was a Bayer product that's on the market for a long time that we had was fabulous in the right patient. So we did it hysteroscopically. So no incisions on the belly whatsoever. A tiny camera goes up the uterus, it deploys coils in the tube, and over three months those coils scar off. We do a little dye test, make sure the coils scarred off completely and nothing can get through the tubes. Fabulous. Amazing for patients who had contraindications to surgery. Great for patients with a higher BMI, right? Um, unfortunately, it was taken off the market because of lawsuits about increase in pain. Um, unfortunate because the vast majority of people didn't have pain, right? Like it was a great way to do sterilization. Um, but as we often know, when margins and fiscal solvency are driving innovation, especially in women's health, um, that companies are just not willing to take bad publicity for financial margins, even for a very needed product. Um, so this survey was done after Esher, but a lot of people wrote that in, with that they would offer that instead if it was still available. Yeah, One is, I wonder your thoughts as a provider and as a surgeon on the caveat that it's completely okay to forgo 30 days in case of an emergency surgery. In my mind, an emergency surgery would not be the opportune time to have a discussion about something like sterilization, in that the patient might not have that sufficient time to consider, and it almost would be more coercive to say, your abdomen, your abdomen is open, do you want a yes or no right now? Yeah, so I think. I'm nodding my head vigorously, right? Like that is terrible informed consent, or um, especially for a procedure that is permanent. And we say irreversible because functionally it's irreversible, right? There are clinics where they reverse tubal sterilizations um, with decent success rates, um, where people can really use IVF to get pregnant afterwards. But the vast majority of patients can't afford the 10 to 15 thousand dollars it costs to either reverse your tubal or do a cycle of IVF, so it's functionally irreversible. Um, 
So the federal policy is for 72 hours. You can't first bring it up as you're rolling back to the OR. Um, you had to have discussed it three days ago. But I think where you draw that line is still unclear, right? Um, I think it's going to take a lot more work with patients and thinking with psychologists and cognitive decision makers for how people make decisions and how far in advance is an appropriate time versus not appropriate time. Ethically, are we okay with the waiting period at all? And what message does this send that people can make decisions about whether or not to have a hip replacement or right other major surgeries without a waiting period? Um, but for sterilization, they need a waiting period. There's really no other examples outside of reproductive health where we allow waiting periods. Um, I think, I mean, the easy answer clinically and ethically is longitudinal counseling. In an ideal world, you've discussed this with your patient through all of antepartum care, right, as a health patient without time-sensitive things, and then the stupid form shouldn't be the barrier. Um, problem is, is not everybody has high-quality outpatient care in a longitudinal relationship with their clinician. So that's actually my second question, is I used to work in a community hospital with a large population of patients lacking prenatal care. It is. Is this better? Okay. So today I want to talk about identifying and assessing multi-level barriers to equitable postpartum sterilization. I'll explain all that in a second. Here are the usual disclosures. Everyone always ends with acknowledgments. I like to start with them because literally nothing else would be possible about what you're going to hear without this fabulous team. So I have an amazing mentor, a multidisciplinary set of co-investigators from around the country. Um, some fabulous research assistants and statistical support, and then trainees whose literal, well, definitely sweat, probably some blood and tears have gone into this project as well. Um, so I appreciate them tremendously. All right, so today I want to start off with sort of a backdrop of the ethical, legal, and clinical issues surrounding postpartum sterilization, identify the barriers to an equitable health policy reform, and then detail the roadmap for future research. Um, incorporating the relevant stakeholders. This isn't going to be an answers oriented talk. In fact, I have more questions after starting this process than I did a few years ago. Um, so I hope this leaves you with the same. All right, so just as background, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare implemented our current Medicaid sterilization policy in 1976 in response to a long history of coerced sterilization against women who were people of color or um, for socioeconomic status. And this form, and I'll show you this in just a second, instituted a specific informed consent form and a 30-day waiting period from when the form was signed to before sterilization could occur. This affects with uh, people covered under Medicaid insurance. It does not apply to Medicare. It doesn't apply to any other federal insurance product like VA, Department of Defense. And it applies to both men and women. As an OBGYN, I'm mostly interested in the female component, and so I'm going to be focusing on that solely today. Um, and it's really easy to say, you know, this history of coercion is long gone. Doctors all perform ethically today. We don't really need this. Um, but unfortunately, as recently as 2006 to 2010, 150 Latina inmates were reportedly coercively sterilized in the California penal system. So this isn't just yesterday's Use. This is unfortunately is contemporary medical practice as well. And so has anyone seen this Medicaid sterilization form? Raise your hand. One? Okay. So if you so one person. So if you ask our federal government to come up with a way to ensure informed consent, this is what they give you. Right? Like laughable. Um, it is in eight-point font. The reading level is about 13. Somewhere in there, there's a description of the fact that sterilization is permanent, that it means you can't have children, that it's not reversible. There's a little section for an interpreter statement, but this is not what any bioethicist would think of as informed consent, right? This is not a process. This is really just a form, and a form that no one can understand. And ethically, it's highly problematic, right? So it places a huge restriction on autonomy. I can think of few other examples in medicine that we are okay with a waiting period for what somebody with decision-making capacity can decide to do for their own body. So a 30-day waiting period. Um, also, the literacy level is much too high. So when you ask, they did a study of um, patients who underwent the standard counseling process and were asked and signed this consent form and were asked three questions. 
One, is sterilization permanent? Two, is it reversible? And three, can you have more children afterwards? And only a third of patients answered all three of those questions correctly. That's a huge problem before you're about to embark on a surgery that is irreversible and life-altering. And also problematic is that this covers Medicaid patients only. And often in many states, Medicaid insurance is tied to the pregnancy and expires postpartum for a lot of women. So if you don't address contraception during the pregnancy episode and wait until her postpartum visit and then try to wait 30 days, they may no longer have active health insurance for you to actually do the surgery. So you again clinically have restricted something that they want um, autonomously for their own body. Furthermore, it's just discriminatory. So 37 to 51% of women who want postpartum sterilization who are covered by Medicaid are unable to actually achieve it after their delivery. And this affects Medicaid patients twice as often as privately insured patients. And even within Medicaid, there's tiers of um, sterilization fulfillment. So women of color, African American and Latina predominantly, are about half as less likely, half as likely as white patients on Medicaid to obtain their desired sterilization. Um, so really is set up this two-tiered system and compounds barriers for women of color. So it seems really easy after all of that, right? Like just get rid of the forms. I don't really know what purpose it serves. And that's actually what I thought about 10 years ago where I went with a group with ACOG, the American College of OBGYNs, to CMS um, on DC and said, let's just get rid of these forms. Like it's clear. Ethically it's problematic, it's discriminatory. What purpose does it serve? And I think this was my first foray into learning sort of the nuances of good in public policy, is that we were actually met by stakeholder groups who represented the women we thought we were trying to help, right? So uh, public uh, focus groups and patient advocacy groups representing women of color and those socioeconomic status saying, hold on a second, right? There is still coercion in today's medical environment. Like this isn't, you can't just remove this and not put other protective measures in place. Um, so probably more of a balancing act is needed. Uh, and so that's where today's talk focuses on. So we shifted to a health disparities uh, framework to reevaluate this rather than sort of just the pro-con of the normative uh, framework I was using before. Um, and really looking at this in a systematic way and identified several levels of barriers that needed to be addressed. So this is adapted from Kilbourne's public health um, disparities framework. And she invests, uh, identifies patient level, uh, physician level, hospital level, and policy level barriers. So these are sort of adapted for sterilization. I'm gonna go through each one. So at the patient level, different patients have individual beliefs and preferences about the type of contraception that they want race, ethnicity, culture, their family values, all play into this, right? And so we really need to figure out how to assess what each woman wants intrinsically and make sure that she ends up getting it. Um, and how do we best go about doing this? I'm gonna to touch on this a little bit later um, in a discussion this afternoon, but choice isn't static, right? Choice isn't static in reproduction, it isn't static for really any people. So we looked at 8,600 women at my hospital. It's a county hospital, tertiary care, serving primarily the underserved, and mapped their contraceptive goals from antepartum to postpartum care, so a period about a year, and organized them by tiers of efficacy according to the CDC. So tier one is sterilization and long-acting reversible contraception. But basically, suffice it to say, people's goals change from when they first find out they're pregnant to after they deliver. In our study, only 12% of women had a consistent plan from antepartum to postpartum care. And so how are you supposed to be able to assess, much less sign the form and wait 30 days, if you're not really quite sure what their preference is going to be? Um, also, in this study, uh, we looked at sort of what the patient level impact of this policy would be, and whether there's markers of who ended up wanting sterilization and whether they got it or not, to try to better understand if we could fine tune our policy in a way that was evidence-based. And so what we found is 46% of patients with Medicaid and 65% of patients with privately insured, uh, private insurance received their desired sterilization. And a lot of patients with Medicaid didn't have valid signed consent forms at delivery. So a disparity there, right? That's what's been shown in the literature, uh, which we confirmed at our institution. 
And following them up for a year after delivery, there was, again, compounding disparity. So not only did patients with Medicaid, were they less likely to get their desired sterilization, but they were more likely to end up pregnant in the following year afterwards. <coughs> again, confirming what was shown in the literature. But what we did was different is look at the actual patient level factors that go into this. Again, I just said patient level context like family, their personal preferences, their culture, their religion, all of that impacts what choice of contraception they want. And so is there something different about those women with Medicaid than those with private insurance? It leads up to differences in their plan goal for contraception and sterilization. And in our study, there was. So patients with Medicaid, are a different patient population than patients with private insurance. And so research and policy shouldn't ignore these differences. And so when we actually adjusted for these differences, and this is important because a lot of this impacts what contraceptive plan you choose, right? If you have more kids versus fewer kids, if you had a C-section versus deliver vaginally, race, ethnicity, et cetera, all change your cultural preferences and personal level preferences, the difference between Medicaid patients and privately insured patients actually went away. So it was no longer significant. Rather, some of these other things, like how many kids you had, whether you delivered by C-section, did you have adequate prenatal care, and what was your gestational age of delivery, all of those were much more important in determining whether you got sterilized. <coughs> and we showed that not just in this sort of bivariate yes, no sterilization, but also time to sterilization, the same relationships played into were in play there. And then finally, when you group patients together to look at community rather than individual patients, we saw not only did individual patient mat preferences matter, but the neighborhoods that they were living in. So area deprivation index is a HRSA measure that looks at sort of the health resources in somebody's community, and it's been linked to a number of health outcomes. So basically, you can be rich living in a poor area, and you worse than somebody who is poor living in a rich area, right? Which sort of makes sense from a social determinants of health perspective, but it's a way to quantify it. And we showed the same thing. So women with Medicaid who live in areas that were more deprived in terms of neighborhood resources were less likely to get sterilization, took longer to get it, less likely to attend their postpartum visit, and more likely to get pregnant within 365 days of their index delivery. So in sum, Women with Medicaid and private insurance are different patient populations. And the problems with some of the past research is that they've always been equated identically, right? And when you throw these in a regression model and then look for disparities, you're not actually doing anybody a service because they shouldn't be equal. We're looking at equity, not equality. Um, and more importantly, our policy shouldn't focus on why people deserve, desire things at different rates. That's what autonomy is about but fixing the barriers to them autonomously desired contraception. So that's things like structural barrier, barriers to care, the social determinants of health, and these clinical differences such as parity, route of delivery, um, and gestational age that are the true mediating factors on this disparity on postpartum sterilization. All right, so moving forward to the next level, and that's the provider level. So we did an interview of OBGYNs around the country asking them how time urgent they felt postpartum sterilization was. Um, and this is given the context that for about two decade, decades, ACOG has policy out there saying that postpartum sterilization is an urgent, not an elective procedure, because it's time mediated and needs to be done before that woman's discharged home, and because of all of the health and public health outcomes we've just talked about. And yet, the vast majority of OBGYNs in our survey responded that they feel like this is an elective procedure. The bottom right corner of that sterilization form that I showed you, the federal sterilization form, <coughs> has a contingency. So in normal circumstances, you have to wait 30 days between when a woman signs that form and to when sterilization can occur. But the Medicaid rules allow for two exceptions, and they reduce the waiting time from 30 days to 72 hours for these exceptions. The exceptions are premature delivery and emergency abdominal surgery. As an OBGYN, I don't know what a premature delivery is. I know what a preterm delivery is, right? That's clinically defined, but I don't know what premature is. Is that before the due date? Is that preterm, which is 37 weeks? Like, what is that? And turns out when you interview or you survey OBGYNs across the country, they're just as confused as I am. 
Nobody understands what the term premature delivery is, and it's not defined in any of the federal guidance for this policy. So different doctors were using different gestational age cutoffs, often within the same state, which is a huge issue in terms of fairness, right? If you can go from one hospital in one state to the neighboring hospital in the same town and have different cutoffs on gestational age for when or when not you can get your sterilization. And then we asked doctors, if someone came to you <coughs> and wanted sterilization, what are some factors that would influence your declination? So why would you decline to perform sterilization in somebody who autonomously wanted it? And then later on, we asked, in somebody who didn't initially ask about sterilization, <coughs> what are some factors that would lead you to recommend sterilization? And so some of the things that led people to physicians to decline to perform sterilization are medically related. Right, so BMI, whether an OR was available, but some of them are not really medical. So age, um, and whether they would have an increased risk of regret because they were younger, um, a history of preterm birth, so if they delivered so early that they're not sure how that um, neonate was going to do, maybe they would decline to perform a sterilization even if the woman wanted it, or that potential of the risk of regret. And then we asked, what were some reasons you would recommend sterilization in women who weren't asking for it? Again, some of these were medical, um, so past medical history, which makes sense. It's probably your ethical duty to recommend not getting pregnant if another pregnancy is going to kill you. But some of them reveal a lot of implicit or overt bias, right? So parity, so having too many kids. Um, or some of them are policy issues, so not having alternative methods of contraception and therefore recommending sterilization. And then some of them are really troubling, especially given this is a survey, right? So intrinsic survey bias and what people think is acceptable to respond to in a survey. But people were willing to say that race, education, religion, whether the partner was in agreement were all reasons they would either provide sterilization or not provide sterilization. So we followed this up with qualitative interviews of OBGYNs around the country, and in general heard a lot of similar themes that we were expecting. Most OBGYNs around the country are critical of this policy. They feel it's unnecessary, they feel it's paternalistic, they feel that it's an administrative hassle, that it serves as a barrier to care, and it leads to adverse health outcomes because of unintended pregnancies from unfulfilled sterilization requests. They were aware of the fact that it's discriminatory and compounds the inequities that we see. And of the vast majority of OBGYNs understood the history, right? They were able to explain sort of the historical basis um, and understood the need to counsel regarding the permanence of the procedure. And some of them actually felt that it helped them clinically, that it served as a tool to remind them that they needed to do this longitudinal counseling. I would argue there's probably better ways to remember to do longitudinal contraception counseling rather than a federal policy, um, but at least they were aware that that was attempting to protect the patient. When we asked about the waiting period, though, a minority of physicians supported the waiting period. And they pointed out, rightly so, that there aren't that many other places in medicine that we impose waiting periods between when something, somebody wants something and when it can happen in somebody with decision-making capacity. Surprisingly, or not surprisingly, uh, male older OBGYNs were much more likely to support a waiting period than female OBGYNs. And in fact, we had several male OBGYNs who actually felt the waiting period should be longer, including up to six months, because this is a really big decision that women may regret. Uh, we actually uh, we also asked them about their practices and experiences surrounding this form. And a lot of them talked about either fairly directive counseling towards sterilization or delayed counseling until their postpartum visit, which is obviously problematic. They also talked about workarounds. So if somebody came into labor and delivery who hadn't had prenatal care or had one visit, that maybe they would fudge the date on the forms, right, which is committing fraud or sending patients home with a copy of the form just in case it got lost, but sort of blank dated so they could date it for when they need to. Um, some of them also talked about additional hospital policies that were put in place in order to reduce uh, poor reimbursement. So if this form isn't signed, the government doesn't pay for the sterilization, right? So hospitals obviously are very interested in making sure that the process is followed correctly. So some hospitals had instituted additional barriers um, about hospital legal staff, administrative staff, signing off on each form, making sure it's completed correctly before the sterilization could occur. 
Um, but in general, most OBGYNs were very frustrated about this process and the lack of transparency around the process. So in sum, for the physician level of factors, um, the attitudes, beliefs, and experiences of OBGYNs are fairly complex and diverse. And there were significant gaps in knowledge in terms of the policy specifics and in terms of compliance with relevant national guidance. And the vast majority of OBGYNs shared concerns about the ethics of this form and this process. But some OBGYNs did employ very paternalistic counseling, reveal, we all have implicit bias, but problematic um, in terms of the kind of bias they were um, describing and an overemphasis on the risk of regret. The next um, are the hospital level barriers. And so going back to the chart review I was describing at uh, my institution of 8600 patients, lack of surgeon availability and non-adherence to postpartum care were often the biggest issues that came up as far as why sterilization wasn't done if it was a hospital level issue. Um, and this is increasingly important because of religiously affiliated hospitals. So almost a quarter of deliveries in America today happen at a religiously affiliated healthcare system. A quarter. And that number is only increasing as religiously affiliated healthcare systems um, by other hospital systems and conglomerates. So as the market share increases, we're going to have even higher percentages of women, both Medicaid insurance and privately insured patients, unable to get desired postpartum sterilization. And it's problematic on a number of fronts. There's a lot of lack of transparency on this, right? So it's one thing if the name of the hospital is very religious sounding. People can sometimes figure it out. But as religiously affiliated hospitals are buying what used to be privately owned hospitals, they're often keeping the name. So often in, when you survey patients, they don't actually know they're delivering at a religiously affiliated hospital and won't be able to get their desired contraceptive method postpartum. And this leads to a lot of moral distress of the clinicians there, right? If they don't share the same values as the hospital system in terms of reproductive autonomy. There's also variation in clinical limitations. So because, for the prototypic example in this is Catholic healthcare, right? Because each diocese doesn't necessarily follow the same Catholic directives, there's variation in what diocese A and diocese 2 B will allow in terms of contraceptive methods. And it really compounds inequities in access. So, a lot of these affiliated hospitals are often the only delivering hospital within hundreds of miles in rural America. So women don't have a choice. Um, and so it's often the most vulnerable women who are forced to deliver at places where the full spectrum of care can't be provided. So in some of hospital level factors, these are sort of some of the easy fixes at individual non-religiously affiliated hospital levels, right? OR availability. There are ways to work around this and have policies in place to dedicate OR and staff for these procedures if you truly feel that they are urgent and not elective procedures. Um, and barriers to postpartum care can also be addressed by doing more of these, right? Shifting them to the inpatient delivery episode because then you don't have those uh, long-term barriers to accessing outpatient care. Or also expedited postpartum sterilization scheduling. So often what happens at a lot of places is they'll send you home from the delivery, your sterilization hasn't been done because it's too busy on labor and delivery and we gotta keep the ORs available for C-section so nobody's gonna do a quote unquote collective sterilization. You'll go home, you'll come to your postpartum visit, which only half of women in America actually attend their postpartum visit. And if you're lucky enough to make it there, then we'll schedule you another day and time out for your postpartum sterilization procedure which means if you've already gone back to work because you have to put food on the table, you have to miss another day of work and a few days after for recovery. And so people don't come to their postpartum sterilization appointment, right? And so in randomized control trials, they've done expedited scheduling where they actually schedule the patient for surgery within the four, initial four week time period, um, rather than making them come to an outpatient interval appointment and then a second surgery date. So these are quote unquote easy fixes, right? These are doable at the local level to really move the needle on um, reducing barriers to care. And then there's a whole ethics literature about religiously affiliated hospitals and their duty to disclose, refer, inform. And I won't touch on all of that here because it's a whole separate talk. 
um, but we need to be mindful when we're making policies of the inequities to access and the unique impact on reproductive health. And then finally, at the policy level. So what prior studies didn't do was isolate sort of the true policy <coughs> impact. So what we tried to do is drill down on that in our cohort by using patients who were getting a C-section and one in sterilization. And the reason for that is we couldn't tell, right, and past studies can't tell whether you didn't get your sterilization because of the Medicaid policy, or was it because your surgeon was busy and there wasn't room in the operating room table, or you had just eaten. And so if you were already getting a C-section, you already have everybody, right? You have the anesthesiologist, you have the surgeon. Here, the only, there should be only two reasons you didn't get your sterilization. One, the form wasn't signed. Or two, you changed your mind and you didn't want it anymore. And so when we looked at our cohort for this, we found that privately insured patients, 91% of women with <coughs> private insurance got their desired sterilization during their time of C-section. But only 77% of people with Medicaid did it, did. And of the people with Medicaid, the two-thirds of them didn't have valid signed consent forms. So that's the true impact of this policy. But importantly, 9% of them had changed their mind. Uh, and so that conversation needs to happen, right? That this isn't this static, you want sterilization of this first prenatal visit, we're going to follow that train wherever it leads, but an evolving discussion with the patient and the clinician about what her contraceptive goals are. It seems really obvious to a bioethics group, is not that obvious often to a clinical audience. Because of the lack of transparency and the variation we had found in our clinical interviews of OBGYNs, we next interviewed Medicaid administrators um, across the country to ask what their policy was. How do they define these things? How do they process these forms? So we started with, how did you define premature labor? When these forms come across your desk and you're, <coughs> you're stamping approved or not approved, what's your cutoff? And what's <coughs> kind of troubling is a lot of places didn't have firm guidance on it. They didn't have a cutoff. So whatever that person sitting behind that desk thought that day, that was what they went with. Um, some had a firm cutoff, but only three states. A lot of them didn't have that cutoff. And also more problematic in their interviews, they fully acknowledged they didn't ever communicate this to the physicians in their state. So when I called, I practice in Ohio, right? Should be fairly easy to call up my state Medicaid office and ask them what the policy is in the state where I practice. I was on hold for about two hours, and then finally we got a conference call about ten with ten different administrators, including three lawyers for the state, and we still didn't come up with a cutoff for what I can practice. Like, how is any doctor supposed to follow the rule if they don't actually know what the rule is? They also didn't have definitions for what emergency abdominal surgery was. So does a C-section and labor count as emergency abdominal surgery? Is it, what is, is it an appendicitis? Like what are the definitions of what an emergency abdominal surgery was? And again, the vast majority of states just said it was case by case review. We're unwilling to sort of make a list of surgeries that were emergency and surgeries that were not emergency. And so some administrator without a clinical background was deciding whether this fit the guidelines or didn't. A third of states had also made modifications to their form. This is perfectly reasonable, right? Medicaid is a federally mandated but state-administered product, so states have the ability to make modifications in the form. And what we often saw is that the modifications were made in ways to reduce barriers to care. So some states had lowered the age limit instead of 21 to 18, which fits for what most other medical things are, and that adults can consent to things that adults want done on their bodies. Um, some had also changed the um, guidelines in terms of the interpreters or requiring a third party witness to make sure that there wasn't coercion. Um, some had also put into guidance changes that were a little bit more problematic. So in some states, they've added exceptions for opioid use disorder. So that for women who have opioid use disorder, you don't have to wait the full 30 days and now you only have to wait 72 hours. On one hand, that's well-meaning. Population has additional barriers of care. On the other hand, it's very stigmatizing um, and of what it means to have opioid use disorder and potentially coercive for a population that's already vulnerable to having their reproduction valued less than women without opioid. 
some, there's a lack of clarity and transparency surrounding the policy level issues. There's significant variation from state to state, which isn't often known to the doctors that practice in that state. And it serves as an independent barrier to care, even when separated from all of the clinical and um, hospital level barriers. So what do we do with all this? How do we move forward having all of this data about all these independent barriers to care? How do we revise this policy in a way that's ethical and clinically just? At face value, it seems really simple, right? You have a patient who desires sterilization, you need to ensure access, and then they get it, fulfillment. It's a really quite a simple equation. But we just talked about there's a lot of mediating complexities. So patient's knowledge, culture, their partner and family values, and physician counseling all impact desire. And access, and these all feed back and forth among each other, right? These aren't static, unidirectional relationships. And access depends on individual local practice patterns, physician's conscience, OR availability, this waiting period, route of delivery. So if you're more likely, some patients may be more likely to be counseled towards a C-section, right, than a vaginal delivery if, if they want a sterilization. And these things also interplay between each other. And what's trickier is that there's interplay among the two variables, right? So conscience impacts counseling, religious mergers impact conscience and OR availability, reimbursement impacts practice pattern. If you're not gonna get paid for something, it's gonna change how often you offer it. Um, and individual hospital policies and insurance impact all of this. So what we get is a big convoluted mess when really the goals are quite simple of reproductive justice and reduction of unintended pregnancy and improvement of maternal health. So how in the world are we supposed to figure all that out? <clears throat> so going back to Kilhorn, she proposes a three-step process to addressing disparities in public health policies. So moving from a detecting to an understanding and finally to a reducing phase. And I think I would argue we're just entering the understanding phase for postpartum sterilization. So we've detected it, we've defined the disparity, we've defined the vulnerable populations, We've measured the disparity in vulnerable populations and looked at some of these confounding effects, right? How many kids you've had before, your insurance, your race, et cetera. Now we're at the understanding level. So identifying the disparity at the various levels, so the patient level, the provider level, the clinical encounter, and the hospital system. I think there's still work to be done and nailing that down, drilling down at that. And then ultimately, armed with that knowledge, she recommends moving to sort of reducing phase. So intervening, evaluating that intervention, translating and disseminating it, and ultimately changing policy. And ethically, the problem is that it's a very delicate balance, right? So you want, on one hand, you want to protect women who are vulnerable and still vulnerable in today's society because we have stratified reproduction from women who would be good mothers and should reproduce to women who society doesn't want reproducing, either implicitly or overtly. We need to protect from coercion on that end, but on the other hand, we also need to remove barriers to autonomous desire. And there's variation and fluctuation, as I just showed in patient's conception of reproduction, pregnancy intendedness, contraceptive choice, right? So not every woman sees pregnancy as this yes, no thing, right? Some people are okay just not, not trying, right? Or um, an unintended pregnancy may be a failure in terms of public health literature, but it's not a failure for a lot of women and a lot of couples. Um, and I fully acknowledge this is an incredibly heteronormative discussion, um, and I apologize for that. Um, and you'll have to balance that with minimization of regret, right? So when you see a 23-year-old in the office and you know the data shows she's about 60% more likely to regret a sterilization than a 30-year-old, is it appropriate for you to be paternalistic and say, nope, I'm not gonna do your sterilization because you're much more likely to regret it and here's an IUD for you? Or is that inappropriate? Because that 23-year-old is allowed to make decisions she later regrets in life, right? Um, and how do you study all this? Because our traditional tools for health services research are all about inequalities, right? They're not about inequities. So you put things in a regression model, you get p-value statistics, it's about finding evenness, not about me.